want to share with you this morning a passage of Scripture. Same passage of Scripture that uh, the pastor used yesterday at Mary Jo's funeral service. He, he'd said again that he was preaching from the lectionary. This happened to be the lectionary uh, Scripture for, for this week. A lot of times I'll preach from the lectionary. Sometimes I won't. depends on how God leads. This morning I'm preaching from, from the lectionary, that suggestion uh, set of scriptures that, that is given to us to, 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 um, to preach out of. I, I, I got a phone call uh, from my mom and dad a few weeks back, and, and they said, you know, for the last three Sundays, you and our pastor have been preaching from the same passages of scripture. How is that? And I told them, I said, well, we're, we're given a, a lectionary to follow if we desire to follow it. And it just so happens that we were both doing that at the time. Well, this passage of scripture, again, is the one that was read at at Mary Jo's funeral. And wonderful passage of scripture. We're going to look at at a few verses now, and in a few minutes we'll look at at some other verses from the same chapter. But this is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. And in it we find these words. As for me, Paul writes, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now I know that I've told you this before. Um, but I am a, a big, uh, not, there we go, well, not you, big Star Trek fan. Now, as a matter of fact, you won't be able to see it, but, uh, but I've got on my, my Mr. Spock socks this morning that say live long and prosper. I have, I have two sets of Star Trek socks. I, I love the show. I, I'm a science fiction fan. I think Star Trek, if, if you're a Star Wars lover out there, God bless you. Uh, we'll pray for your conversion. Um, Star Trek's better, just the way it is. Okay, uh, <laughs> I like them both, but but I, I do like Star Trek better. Uh, not just the original either, you know that picture up there, but but all the the, the spinoffs. You know, uh, right now there are twelve different spinoffs. Now, I'm not counting the movies. I'm talking about TV shows from Star Trek. Uh, my favorites are uh, uh, the original, of course, and and Star Trek Enterprise, uh, Picard, Discovery. Strange New Worlds, and and especially The Next Generation. Uh, One of my favorite characters from The Next Generation is is this guy. Anybody know who he is? Nobody knows who he is. (laughs) Peggins. You got to start watching the show. This is Lieutenant Commander Worf, W-O-R-F. Lieutenant Commander Worf. And as you can see, Worf is not human, right? Uh, Worf is a Klingon. And uh, he was orphaned, though, as a baby. His parents were killed, and he was raised by a human family. And so a lot of times on the show, Star Trek The Next Generation, and he's actually on a couple of the other shows as well, the spinoffs, he's dealing with the tension of being a Klingon by birth uh, and a human uh, in his upbringing. Matter of fact, in one episode that's, that's titled uh, Sins of the Father, uh, Worf has to go back to his home planet Klingon to defend the honor of his birth family, uh, his father and family. His father has been posthumously accused of participating in a disgraceful massacre. And if it goes through and he's found guilty, it will disgrace Worf's family for seven generations. So not only is he going to be disgraced, but any uh, further generations of his family for seven years will be disgraced. And so through a series of political maneuvers and, and the revelation of some political corruption, I mean, we can never imagine that happening, I know, um, a, a compromise is reached and, and Worf will accept what's called a, a discommination. If he will admit that his father was guilty, Uh, to please the political pundits there at the time, and and also to help his brother who's still on the planet. Everything else, the truth, all the dirty secrets, the lies, are all going to be 
to be swept under the table. And his honor, his family's honor is going to be spared. However, in order for that to happen, one last thing has to be done. As he leaves, and he leaves with Captain Picard, who's there to help him in his defense, he has to walk out of the assembly with all the leadership there, all the people there, including his brother, turning their backs on him as he walks away. And it's a very powerful episode. Uh, but what a way to go out. You know. uh, what a way to move on in life. It was so dramatic and so powerful. Well, this passage of Scripture that, that I read just a few minutes ago from 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is getting ready to, to move on as well. And, and with all that, that he, had, he had done because of his, his faith in God, his love for God, his commitment for Christ, uh, he had a lot to look back on. He had a lot to celebrate. And while it is in the Bible, we're reading actually a letter between the second letter between Paul and Timothy. Timothy, a young pastor that Paul is mentoring. And so as much as this is a, a book of, of one of the epistles in Scripture, one of the letters, it's also a very personal uh, thing as well. It's almost like a, a private message. Uh, again, a talk between a young pastor and his mentor. But here it is for us to read. Even though it was written for one, one person, here it is for us. And, and people often wonder why. You know, why do we have these two letters to Timothy, to an individual in the Bible? Well, because like everything else in the Bible, it's there for a purpose. There's a, there's a lesson or really a series of lessons to be learned here. There, there's a life to consider for Timothy, there, there's a life to model, not only for Timothy to model, but also for us as, as Christians today to model as well. And so as we listen in, we hear this challenge to, to live the, the, the type of life that, that the gospel requires us to live. Now, I, I'm going to be honest with you today. In, in this society, we don't like to be required, it seems, to do anything, do we? You know, we don't like words like required or demand or command, right? You know, I'll do that with my kids if they say something to me. I'll say, are you asking me or telling me? <laughs> right? You ever done that? You asking me or you telling me? Because if you're asking me, that's one thing. But if you're telling me, you know, maybe you don't have that right to tell me what to do as my child. Maybe you'd be better off asking me. So, so maybe instead of being commanded or required to do this that I'm going to get into today, maybe Paul's inviting us uh, to do this. Try to sweeten it up a little bit because we like things a little sweet, don't we? So Paul's inviting us. God's requiring it, but Paul's inviting us. To enter into this kind of life that he's getting ready to talk about. Matter of fact, I, I called this this morning an, an as for me kind of life, right? As for me. It, and what, what was Paul's life? Well, I think the first thing we can say about Paul's life is it was all or nothing. You know what? It was all or nothing. Uh, I think about the, the volleyball team, especially last night, you know. Uh, it was tough. We, they, they had a team that, that brought everything to the table against them. And um, they toughed it out. You know. But they had, in order to do that, they had to give their all. I, I want you to understand this morning that, that God requires nothing less than us giving our all for him. Now, that sounds like a lot, doesn't it? I mean, let's face it, all is... All, right? All is everything. But when we consider this morning that, that God gave his all for us, that Jesus, when he came, gave his all for us, how could he not ask for that in return? Because even in us giving our all for God, God's not asking us to do anything close to what Jesus did, is he? Our all is a lot easier than his all for us. 
But but Paul was a, a person who was who was an all for nothing, all or nothing. I mean, he he did it. He you know, if if you're not going to do it the best you can, just don't even do it at all. And that's how Paul was. You know, like like Lieutenant Commander Worf, Paul was Paul was willing to let the world turn its back on him, if need be, in order for Paul to live the Christian life that that God had called him to live. So I want to look at at this life of Paul that he's writing about, and the first thing he says there in verse six is, "As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering for God, as an offering to God." Now, other translations of the Bible, instead of that phrase poured out, will will use the term libation. When was the last time you used the word libation in a sentence? Probably not, probably haven't been, you know, not very recently, right? I want to get a libation, or I'm going to pour my life out as a libation. It's not a word we use very often. Well, the Greek word is is actually uh, spindo. There it is in, in Greek. Spendo. S P E N D O. And spendo means uh, to be spent. Paul says, My life has already been spent for Christ. But it's deeper than just be spent. Because if I go home and I tell Martha, Man, I really spent this evening, that means I'm tired, right? Means that I've given up my all. Again, that's the kind of person Paul was. But the word goes deeper than that. It actually means, uh, can sometimes mean to be put to death or to have your life's blood spilled out, poured out. Again, meaning that you give you all and you don't hold anything back. But a libation also in, in scripture is a liquid sacrifice. You know, we have animal sacrifices that, that the people were required to give. You had grain sacrifices like wheat that people were required to give, and you had libation offerings. The liquid sacrifice. It's what we do with the leftover juice after communion. I, uh, a lot of times churches will go and they'll just take the leftover juice and communion and pour it down the sink. I don't do that because I, we've already sanctified that. It's set apart for God's purpose. So when communion is over, a lot of times you'll see Virginia take the off, take the, the leftover juice and she'll go out and she'll pour it out onto the ground because that's what you do with a libation offering. It's poured out on the ground. We've sanctified that juice for communion, so you don't just want to pour it down the sink to go into a septic system somewhere, the water treatment plant. You pour it out as an offering to the Lord. So Paul says, my life has already been poured out as a libation. It's already been poured out to God. But this morning, I don't want you to think about this being death because it's really not what it means here. This isn't about dying. Paul's letter to Timothy isn't saying, Timothy, I'm dying and I want you to as well. I want you to think about dying. No, that's not what he's telling Timothy. He says, Timothy, I've lived my life and I'm ready to go, but I want you to think about living. This is a letter about living. Being poured out as a life, living for Christ, a call to live. Paul's obviously still living here, right? You know, he's writing the letter, so he's still alive. He says, my life is, is already a libation. I've already been poured out. Even though I'm, I'm still here, my life, my purpose for being has already been poured out. In other words, I know what I'm here for. I know what life is all about. And life is all about living for the one who gave me life. Life is all about living for Christ who loves me and gave me this new life that I now have because I was a man who was against Jesus. I was a person who was against his church. I was killing his people and enjoying every minute of it because I thought I was doing it for God. And then God showed me that the way that I was living was wrong and he knocked me off my horse, literally, and blinded me so that he could show me the light, literally, and now I live. Now I have life. And now instead of pouring my life out for something that I feel is right, for something that gave me pleasure, for something that I felt I wanted to do, now I'm giving my life for the one that I live for. Because I no longer live for myself. I live for Christ. I live for Christ. So if Paul sees this activity, this, this dedication to God, as not just living life, but living life 
to its fullest. See, Paul sees this as, as the fulfillment of Jesus' promise in John chapter 10, verse 10, when Jesus says that living for God leads to life more abundantly. And Paul says, I'm living an abundant life. Now, I want you to realize this morning where Paul's writing from. He's writing this letter from prison. And it's not his first time being there. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But he still says, I'm living. I'm living abundantly. And this is what he says next in that verse. He says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. He's still alive. He says, but I fought and I finished and I've remained faithful. Does that mean he's done with doing it? No, absolutely not. It means this is the course that he's on and he's going to finish it. He's going to complete that course. One of the things that I was told growing up in sports, one of the things that we try to tell the volleyball team, and I know if you play baseball or if you play basketball, whatever it is that you play, you know, the phrase is what? It ain't over till it's over. Or the fat lady saying, whichever one. <laughs> okay. It ain't over till it's over. Don't stop. That's what you're telling them, right? Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't quit giving your best. Don't quit doing what's right. Because it ain't over until it's over. Folks, for us, it ain't over until Jesus calls us home. And Paul knows that. So he's not in prison giving up, saying, well, I fought the good fight, and I finished the race, and I remained faithful. He says, no, it's still going on. But I want you to know it's going to continue on until it does become a past tense in my life. In other words, when Jesus does call me home. I love, uh, who wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull? Some of you older folks. Who wrote, you remember who wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull? I don't remember. I, I, I read it in probably elementary school. But he wrote another book, and, and this book is subtitled uh, Tales of Reluctant Messiah. And I know I've probably shared this with you before because it's one of my favorite things. But I read that book as well. And, and at the beginning of a chapter, it's like chapter, I don't know, 12. All right? And, it, and there's one sentence on the page that says, how do you know when your work in life is over? And you turn the page and it says, if you're still breathing, it isn't. That's the whole chapter. <laughs> okay. How do you know your work with, with God is over? How do you know God's finished with you? If you're still breathing, it isn't. That's what Paul said. Not only have I fought it, finishing it, I'm going to remain faithful. The good fight. What's a good fight? What's a good fight? A good fight is when a person or a team does the best of their ability, right? They compete to the best of their ability. Even in, even in defeat. They fought the good fight. When a fighter or, or a team competes to the best of their ability. So, so Paul's not talking about defeat here, though. He's talking about being victorious. He says there's a prize. There's a reward awaiting. There's a crown awaiting me. So a good fight is, is, is a contest worth having. A good fight is a, is a fight worth fighting. You know? and, and again, in this case, it's, it's for the cause of Christ. Reminds me of the late congressman John Lewis's call to, to get into good trouble. A lot of people get into bad trouble. He says when you're into good trouble, what's good trouble? It's getting into trouble for the right reason. It's getting into trouble for the right purpose to bring about, you know, a change, but to bring about the right change. You know, in our case today as Christians, we want to get into good trouble to bring about a holy and righteous change. It's not about fighting for the sake of fighting or getting in trouble just for the sake of getting in trouble to prove strength or toughness. That's, those aren't good fights, you know. A good fight is when we have a purpose and we give it our all. When there's a reason for it. So Paul's talking about here about the fight for redemption, which, which brings with it the transformation and puts us in right standing with God. And he says that fight involves finishing. It ain't over till it's over. And that fight involves remaining faithful. 
keeping the faith. Now, a lot of people keep the faith, but the problem is they're keeping it to themselves. <laughs> and that's not what Paul's talking about here. When he says he kept the faith, it doesn't mean he kept it to himself. It doesn't mean that he hides it away in somewhere and, and out of the light of day. I had that problem last week. Some of you know I went to a concert on Friday night in Hazard, but I bought the tickets in 2019. But I said BC before COVID. I bought these tickets to this concert. And so I, I, I was 99.9% I was .9 I'm not sure I knew where they were. I've got a little safe up in my closet upstairs in the parsonage, and, and I kept telling them there's where the tickets are and there's where the tickets are. So Thursday night, before bed, I go upstairs and I get in my safe to get the tickets. And guess where the tickets were not? <laughs> they were not in the safe. Well, beside the safe is a file cabinet with three drawers. They weren't in the file cabinet. I didn't look just once. I didn't look just twice. I took everything out three times. And I walked downstairs and I said, honey, I hope you're not mad. <laughs> but we probably aren't going to the concert tomorrow. I thought I had them hidden in a corner somewhere where I'd remember where it was when the time was right. They're still somewhere in that house. Now, thank God, I got an email from the company that sold me the tickets, and I got in touch with them, and I got another set of tickets, so we were able to go. But faith doesn't work that way. You get one set, and that's it, okay? All right? You get one set of faith, and that's it. Now, you ask God to increase it, and God's going to tell you, you know how you increase your faith? Same way you increase your muscles. You exercise it. Right. You use it. Same way you increase your belly. You feed it. <laughs> you can't just keep it somewhere hidden away. Paul says, I've kept the faith. I've kept the faith. I set it out there. I set it out there even at the risk of going to jail. I set it out there even at the risk of causing someone temporary emotional harm by standing up against sin. By not only sharing them the love of God, but the holiness and the righteousness and the truth of God, which we will pray, will also lead to their salvation, their acceptance of Christ Jesus. And to be honest, we can lose a lot today in our society by keeping the faith. We, we can lose relationship with family members. We can lose relationship with our friends. We, 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 risk, we risk losing the status, uh, maybe in our communities, because we will keep the faith. You know, we'll lift up Christ. Paul declares he's made that choice to keep the faith. And folks, we have to make that choice every day. Because we don't live in a righteous world, do we? We don't live in a world where everybody's a Christian. We don't live in a world where society believes, hey, everybody ought to go to church on Sunday. We all just ought to praise God. And, and a matter of fact, we won't do anything else on Sunday. We'll shut everything else down so y'all can go to church. No, we don't live in that world, do we? We don't live in a world where promises are kept. We don't live in a world where truth reigns supreme. We live in a world of sin. We live in a world of deceit. We live in a world of lies. We live in a, live in a world of injustice. We live in a world where the church is looked down upon, where Christians are called idiots and, and said, told, or we're told that we believe in myths. That's the world we live in. Why? Because the devil's the ruler of this world. The Bible says that. Jesus calls him the prince of the power of the air. He rules this world. So if we're living a Christian life, we're coming, we're coming against this world. We're coming against what the ruler of this world believes in, and he doesn't like it. And the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and he's not going to devour his own children. He's going to devour us, God's kids. And we need to remember that. Thankfully, greater is he who's in us, the Bible says, than he who's in the world. So we can stand up against the devil. We can stand up against this society in the name of Jesus, and the devil has to flee, but that still doesn't mean it's not going to cost us. Paul's in prison. Case in point, right? We risk it. But we risk it for the prize. I've remained faithful, finished the race. 
And he says that, that there's a prize awaiting him. And he says in verse 8, the prize isn't just for me, but for everyone, for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Are we keeping the faith today? Now I want to share with you the this, this, this second few verses, 16, 17, and 18. For the first time, I was brought before the judge. No one came with me. I told you you'd been there before, right? The first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. And he rescued me from certain death. Yes, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. So Paul says, I remain faithful. Finish the course, kept the faith. Why? Because I know the author of faith. Because I know who it is who's got that reward for me. Because I know who it is who truly loves me. Folks, you've got people in this world that tell you how much they love you as long as you're doing what they say. As long as you'll be with them, support them, uphold them, that the minute you're not in agreement with them, they will turn their backs on you quick. It'll happen. Why? Because they don't know true love. They don't know what it means to be truly faithful. See, we only can keep the faith when we know the author of faith. Right? Who are we faithful to? Too many people in this world are, are only faithful to themselves. We need to remember just who it is we're to have faith in. Again, Paul's in prison as he writes this letter to Timothy, and it isn't the first time. Look at what he says there in verse 16. The first time I was brought before the judge, and, and think about this now. No one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. Imagine that. Nobody. None of his friends, none of his family, none of his brothers and sisters in Christ, no one in the church came to be with Paul as he faced judgment. No one. Alone. But he said this, and I love this, may it not be counted against him. In other words, I forgive you. You weren't there for me, but I forgive you. You know what happens sometimes when people in the church have a need and nobody in the church gives them a phone call? I'm never going back to that church. They say they're a loving church. They weren't there for me. I'm not going back. Is that the attitude we're supposed to have? We're all human. We make mistakes. We screw up. Let's face it. There's a lot of us have good intentions, and I'm one of them to call people and ask them how they're doing, and sometimes I do it and sometimes I don't. And I hope that I am forgiven for the times I don't. But it happens. Paul said it happened to him. I was, I was in prison. I was standing before the judge. He had my life in his hands and nobody was there to support me. But I forgive him. Thank God. Thank God. You know? Because here's why. Again, I said in order to keep the faith, we have to know the author of faith, right? Verse 17, the first part. But the Lord stood with me. The Lord stood with me. I knew he was there. I felt his presence. His Holy Spirit's dwelling in me. I'm almost done. See, not only did God stand with him, God was the source of his strength. Paul says that. The Lord gave me the power to, to, to risk moving beyond my safe space. The Lord gave me the power to, to get out of my comfort zone. The Lord gave me the power to go into a world where I can stand on his hope and his promises and his word and his love, and I can be faithful to him. And so Paul assures us that, that, that even in our fear, even in our hesitation, God will provide for us a new sense of safety. He'll give us a new understanding of security because he's the one that we stand beside, and he's the one who stands beside us. Now, one last thing I got to look at. 
This is the end of verse 17 and in verse 18. And he rescued me from certain death. Yes, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Sometimes we need to be reminded that, that being a Christian in, in a sinful world isn't easy. Sometimes we need to be reminded that as we strive to serve God, we do come against the ruler of this world and that the struggle is real. Sometimes we need to be reminded that, that, that Jesus never promised us a rose garden, right? But even if he had, there are thorns in the rose garden. Paul understands this. Why does he understand it? Because he's experienced it. Again, not just once, but over and over again. And I know today we want sermons about comfort and, and we want sermons about a lack of pain and, or sorrow or suffering, but that's not the promise that God gives us. Paul says, I've been rescued, right? He rescued me from certain death. I don't know about you, but every time I read a story about somebody rest, being rescued, that means at some point they've been in danger. They've been in trouble. They've had some trials and tribulations that they're going through. You know, if we have continual joy and peace and blessings, we don't need to be rescued, do we? Right. And Paul said this after becoming a Christian, after be, being a, a child of God, after believing in Christ Jesus, he rescued me from certain death, even the first time when nobody else stood with me. And as Peter would write later on, in 1 Peter 4.12, he says, Don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Keep on doing what's right. Trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. Amen. Amen. Remember that. Hold on. God's presence is a presence that's real and it's felt and it's available to every one of us who believe. His presence in, in the Holy Spirit who dwells in those who, who believe in Christ Jesus, the rescue is found in, in living a life that's poured out as a libation offering for God, a, a life that's all in for God. And we find who we are when we give ourselves away. We hold on to, to our true sense and our true essence and our true faith when we spend ourselves for the cause of Christ. We're poured out so that the glory is given to the one who we pour ourselves out for and not to ourselves. And there we find joy and there we find real life and there we find the life worth living. And as for me, just as it was for Paul, just as it was for Peter, and I pray just as it is for you today, I will serve the Lord.